<laughs> Watching uh, my boys kind of fight and bicker with each other and sort of see that uh, brotherly love. I'm reminded that you can love each other by, you know, still giving them an elbow or two and uh, appreciate the way you've loved me and giving me the 130 session. Uh, I feel like a, an elbow, but I know that you appreciate me still uh, all the same. But uh, all joking aside, I'm, I'm extremely grateful and humbled to be here and uh, reminded of many things and thinking about homecoming and uh, seeing scenes and where scars were uh, uh, given and uh, formed and where individuals made decisions to give their life to Christ and uh, life-changing moments for me and uh, thinking about individuals and I see your faces and uh, that I'm here before you because of the sacrifices and the love that you've shown and to, to just hear Grady uh, for the more go on about uh, the church uh, it's humbling and I'm, I'm thankful to stand before you to preach the gospel there's a grave marker in a cemetery in Albuquerque New Mexico over the spot where five year old Billy Decott was laid to rest after his brief life was ended by Burkitt's lymphoma and in the course of Fighting that disease, Billy was taken to Children's Hospital in Boston for treatment that ultimately proved unsuccessful. The family's wish was that he could be taken home to die, but his condition had deteriorated to the point that it seemed impossible until Dr. Hope Druckmann, a pediatric resident, offered to accompany Billy and his parents on the flight back to Albuquerque. You see, the plane hit a snag, though, as it got to Dallas, and because of Billy's worsening condition, that they, they weren't going to allow him to fly. And so they had to take him to a hospital, and all night, Dr. Uh, Druckmann just spent her time trying to find a, a flight and, and get things done, talk to even uh, the Air Force to try to get a flight to, to get home, and finally it was remembered at about 1 a.m., uh, she made a call to a surgeon who had a, a, a private plane, and so they made the call and hearing about Billy's situation says I, I'll, I'll fly him but we don't have enough room for everybody so the family got on a commercial plane and, and flew to Albuquerque and Billy made it to Albuquerque too and when they got to the hospital surrounded by his family he passed peacefully and on a grave marker where Billy lays is the date of birth and date of death and these words, hope brought him home. Hope brought him home. And I thought that was pretty fitting as an introduction to think about what we're talking about in the book of Revelation. <laughs> hope brought him home in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3 talks about the idea that it was a, the endurance of hope. Is one translation patience of hope that is this fight that we have because of our hope. And that's what the great book of Revelation is. And when we see these churches just fighting and struggling, I'm reminded of home again. To think about sometimes in a home, I don't know if it was like this in your home, <laughs> maybe there's laziness that sets in in adolescence. There is sort of this, you know, hey, even uh, my generation, you know, we're, we're a lot of us living at home, uh, right? And you're, there's just no motivation. There's no urgency. There's no growth because we're home. And, and I, I want to put this before us and as a challenge to you to think about homecoming and, and where you stand. And, and may this be a motivation. Is there a fight going on in your life? I'm afraid too many of us, and I see myself all too often reflecting and going, why are you so lackadaisical about the things going on? Your son's already 10. Is he going to be ready to fight the fight? Do you realize that we're in a spiritual battle? It's war. And that's how the book of Revelation talks about it. Here we have this great, enormous battle. And I wonder if too many of us are walking through this life as, hey, it's no big deal. I think there's a tendency, talking about home, 
And it's great when we speak of it in family and what that means when we can grow together and we love one another and what that can offer in terms of our ability to motivate and, and how we can encourage. But is there not also this tendency to just get kind of stale? I don't really want to ruffle any feathers. I don't want to push them in that way. And, and maybe it's not my place. And I don't know. And maybe we forget what we're doing as a spiritual body sometimes. And, and I hope this message, the Pergamum, can sort of motivate us. I hope all the messages that the, the seven churches can encourage us to look at here and see, hey, we're talking about a war. There's war terms. There is serious fighting going on. We're going to see it in this text. And I hope you'll read with me as we get uh, our context and our section in verses 12 through 17. Revelation chapter 2, 12 through 17 reads, And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things says he who has the sharp two-edged sword. I know your works and where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. And you hold fast to my name. And you did not deny my faith, even in the days in which Antipas, my faithful martyr, who was killed among you, where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you, because you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols, and to commit sexual immorality. Thus you also have those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which things I hate. Repent or else I'll come to you quickly and I'll fight against uh, them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I'll give some of the hidden manna to eat and I'll, I'll give him a white stone. On, and on that stone a new name written, which no one knows except him who receives it. Here a great text, a, a wonderful church as we can think about it, and one of the messages that's already been going, and I won't dwell long there, but to think about how really great churches sometimes have really big problems. Sometimes really great churches have really big problems. There's a big problem here, and yet there's this commending, and even to the point of death here, we have this, this church being faithful, these people standing up for Jesus' name, and sometimes really good churches have really big problems. But if we're not careful and we don't see the battle as being spiritual, then we'll just sort of overlook them. We'll be taken away. And, and I think there's a sense in which that's happened to Pergamos. And, and oh, how we need to pray it doesn't happen in our own homes, in our own congregations. Here if we think about what's going on, I want to talk about this, these two verses that sort of sandwich in my mind, verses 13 through 15. When you look at verses 13 through 15, will be a lot of the meat I want to talk about and look at and bring some lessons from. But when you, you see that verses 12 and 16 sort of sandwich us together, and, and I think they offer a challenge for us and some things to think about that will motivate us as we look at those lessons. But notice what's written there. As we come to know, as is a mark of each of these letters, the presence of Jesus. Jesus is here and we see this vision going back to, to chapter 1 and the, the piece of the vision that we see uh, that Pergamos needs to hear is these things says he who has the sharp two-edged sword. Sharp two-edged sword. Would you go to, Reve keep a finger here, Revelation 19. Look at Revelation 19. There's a little bit of information and uh, with so much, uh, I feel like Brother Williamson and I know Sam felt the same. There's so you could dwell in, in one spot and, and preach a great lesson over and over again. Perhaps all of them could have come from one church. But when you think about this in verses 19, uh, or in Revelation chapter 19, look at verse 11. Now I saw heaven opened and behold a white horse and he who sat on him was called faithful and true and in the righteousness he judges and he makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written on it that no one knew except himself. He, he was clothed with a robe and dipped in blood and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, sharp sword that with it he should strike the nations and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron he himself treads the winepress of the almighty uh, uh, winepress of the fierceness and the wrath of the almighty God and he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written king of kings and lord of lords 
there is insight in, that, in those verses to think about what are we talking about when you, you look back at chapter 2 and you see this sword, a uh, sharp two-edged sword, and he says, verse 16, like I said, I, I believe sort of uh, helps us if we see this together. You repent or I'll quickly come to you. I'll fight against them with the sword of my mouth. We see, at least in some sense, a a matter of certain judgment, some things that were going to shortly come to pass, and uh, uh, we'll talk more about that in that section 13 through 15. But when you, you think about Jesus coming, he, He's willing to write to them in that moment, in that time, and say, I, I will bring judgment upon you in the here and the now. And they're going to face that judgment. But there's also, as you back up, and, and not that we should miss that lesson, for us to be very aware of the righteous judgment of God going on. But that we're talking about Ephesians 6 and verse 17, more sword references. That sword of the Spirit, which is the very Word of God. Yes. Yes. The Word of God, and, and I know it was mentioned in the other lessons, but to think about what, what does that even mean to you? What do you, what do you think about the words in which we hold in our hands and how we, how do we even begin to think about them? I, I'm humbled as I consider what Moses wrote in Deuteronomy chapter 6. The, the instruction to parents to always be talking about the word of God. When you rise up and when you are sitting uh, at lunch or when you're eating and when you lay down and at all times I'm, I'm talking about God's word with them or I'm talking about God with them based upon the information we have from his word. These things says he who has the sharp to his sword. He is the very words of life. And oh how we pursue other things and I... I think that's major. We're going to make reference to them in 13 through 15 for us to hold on to the power of God's Word and what we have in our hands and the ability we have to transform our very hearts and our very minds. I was hesitant to talk about this. I'm not going to spend a lot of time, but uh, there, there was a lot of information that came out and actually it was in an article on uh, defeating pornography and the defeat against other addictions. And it actually talked about this, the basis for their teaching. And it went back to Ephesians 5 and talking about the washing of the water by the Word. Um, but it, it talked about how our brains, our brains are physically changed at night. <laughs> physically changed. And what uh, addictions do to us and, and pornography especially and it was talking about this younger generation and how even the, the world addicted to it but how do we break that how do we stop that and this powerful teaching that has come out and talking about how a meditation on the word of God and thinking upon the word of God literally by the way that your brain works you can it, it actually makes a physio, uh, physiological difference in your mind when you meditate upon scripture and put those things in your mind instead of digital devices and especially harmful images but I thought about that and I know I didn't give you a lot of information and I'll give you that article if you want to go read it and think about that and I, I think we're all here and you're sort of I know you're tired uh, and I know you're full and I know it's nap time and I know another preacher saying the word of God is powerful it's sharper than any two-edged sword it pierces to the division of soul and spirit of jointed marrow it's a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of my heart and I want to know how I can make that more clear for us but it can actually physically change your brain the things that you think on can do that and God says I want this to be on your mind it's sharp it's piercing. It's powerful. And I wonder if we realize it. Okay, as we move into verses 13 through 15, think about maybe the heart of what's going on here. And we'll make reference to those ideas more about the power of the word. But notice verses 13 through 15. I know your works and where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. 
And you hold fast to my name and did not deny my faith, even the days which Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. And you think about what that's, where Satan's throne is. And we know and realize in perhaps passages from Corinthians and Ephesians chapter 6 even that talks about our warfare, right? It's not carnal, but uh, we're talking about this spiritual warfare. It is serious business when we think about this. But Satan's throne, you know, in Pergamum was a city, a Roman province. And uh, when we, th we think about that, it was considered one of the, ca or the capital of, of, this Rome, of Asia Minor uh, for over 25 years was an important religious center for a number of pagan cults. It was the first city in Asia to build a temple to Caesar and it became the capital of cult worship. And uh, when you think about the overall message of the book of Revelation, in my opinion, as we think about warning or uh, keeping hope for the Christians despite the cruelty of the Roman Empire and you can see that in the beasts in Revelation 19 and uh, 12 and how the, the dragon Satan is using the beasts in, in Rome to persecute Christians and to, to have hope and, and it's interesting how emperor worship sort of moved in there because if you think about it and you step back and why would Rome really have a problem with Christianity they, they had plenty of gods and many gods and what is the, the reason in which somebody would really have a problem with Christianity? Here's just another group having another god. What's the big deal? And Satan was able to devise and scheme and get them to, right, exalt the emperor even to the point when they were still living. It was God on earth. But the establishment of these cults or, and this temple worship and to think about what was taking place. I'll increase emperor worship and it'll be a particular thing that these people do to worship emperors. And, uh, and it's interesting that these altars in which they would build surrounded and filled up Pergamum. And even in the midst of all these things and what was taking place, you find in verse 13 something hopeful, this message of encouragement that, that Antipas, my faithful martyr, who was killed among you, where Satan himself dwells. Because Satan was using the beast. He was using Rome. He was using these individuals to, to weaken the faith of Christians. Death's a pretty big motivator for a lot of us. And as these individuals, even to the very point of death, and we're introduced to something that sort of well, if death couldn't do it, even at death it says they were holding fast to my faith and they were continuing to speak the testimony of Jesus or to be witnesses to His greatness. So how, if death isn't even going to be the motivator that gets me, what is it that's going to take me away from God? What's well, interesting how it works in the introduction of Balaam. And Balak, and notice what's said there in verse 14. But I have a few things against you because you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols, and to commit sexual immorality. I know right now you don't want a great history lesson, and I'm not going to give it to you. But when you think back to Balaam and Balak, and if maybe you're not familiar with that story, to think about Balak, the king of Moab, and he's hearing about these Christians, sort of the, the end of their uh, conquest of, uh, you know, coming through, and, and they're getting ready to take the promised land. They've heard about their power. They've heard about how they wiped out Egypt and all these things, and they're a little bit scared and worried. And so he, he looks for, and actually Balaam is, is described as a prophet by Peter. Uh, but a diviner and somebody that Balak knows that whatever he says really goes. And so he was wanting Balaam to curse Israel. Curse these people because we know it's not going to be good for us. And maybe you remember the story with him and the donkey. And how even the, the donkey and the, the ways that Balaam was just fighting against God. And Sam mentioned earlier about Pergamum being this greedy church. The money motivated. And how... Balak threw all the money in the world at him. 
And he came to the point where he says, you can give me all the gold, all the silver. I can't speak against the God of heaven. I can't do anything to thwart that plan, but ultimately what we find out is I can't do it, but they sure can. We can't overtly curse them, but they can curse themselves in other words. And we know how much of a temptation for Israel that idolatry was, that pagan foreign marriages were. And he says you, you might not be able to curse them and defeat them, but just... Just scoot up next to them. Just scoot up next to them and befriend them and watch how easy it is to watch them fall. No, they're not going to overtly curse you. They believe in God. They love God. They're, right? They love the God of heaven and earth. They repeat that daily. But come up next to me and we realize that in Numbers chapter 25, I'm not making all of this up. <laughs> I know it's a little out of order in some ways. Numbers 22 through 24. But Numbers 25, we see the account of where they're cursed. Where, where over 20,000 individuals meet their death. Because of intermarriage. Because of idolatry. Couldn't overtly curse, uh, curse them. But slowly the association with Moab, the, the intermarriage, what they were told not to do. And it was too much for them. And so he says, in the same manner as that, you have individuals among you that are putting a, a stumbling block. A stumbling block. And I thought about Satan's throne. How divisive he is. How powerful he is in the life of the church. Have you thought about that? Do you, do you have any disagreements? Do you have any pain in your life? Have you thought back maybe in even known people? Maybe there's some people that aren't here anymore because of disagreement or some kind of... You know what that was? You know why people aren't walking with God anymore who used to be walking with God? You know who's at the heart of all the pain and all the evil? Have you identified that real force that's working against you? That... that this is really a battle that we have going on in our lives. That's Satan. He's at work. He wants your soul. I thought about the different ways that he works in our lives and we're against the big sins. We're here every week. You're certainly here every week. We praise God. We love God. There was 200 6th through 12th graders who were recently interviewed. And they were asked, they were asked, you know, what is one thing you wish your parents understood about you? <laughs> and as you can imagine, some of the answers got a little bit interesting. You know, like, why do I get uh, blamed when the dog poops on the carpet? Uh, you know, why... Some of those things that, you know, they, why can't I, you know, get an iPhone and uh, different things like that. But then when you got down to the heart of it, there's some pretty serious and pretty heartbreaking responses to that question. What do you wish your parents understood about you? And it's amazing to think that all their responses, and don't worry, the parents, those same 200 parents were asked, those, those 200 kids, their parents were asked, what do you wish your kids understood? And what was amazing about the study is as all those things came together, there were some similar desires. Overall, there were similar desires. And the kids, more than anything, wanted guidance from their parents. And they wanted help and they wanted connection. But overall, and, and one of the themes, and you could talk to Sam about this as we're going, going through this study, is there's really this idea that, that kids felt Overloaded, And I know for some of us, when you first hear that, you think, wow, they just, they really don't have anything going on. But you hear the pleas of these kids and saying, I, I just, we have so much, so much school. We have so much sports. You throw so much on me, so much on me. And then you throw church in the mix and you expect me just to handle it all. Who do you think I am? And, and sort of this, there's this weight. But can you imagine for a moment, and, and, and I know that maybe they're off in some of their perception, but what about perception is reality and this is how they feel and if this is the the church that we need to raise up and we need to to reach them there just was an overwhelming busyness in their life 
like God is just really hard to, to fit in there. And I know there's probably dozens and dozens, maybe hundreds of ways we could have gone and talked about and think about spiritual idolatry. And we're going to talk about one more thing in just a second. But to consider for a moment the, the deceptive way in which Satan works in our lives. I talk to everybody. Con are you busy? <laughs> our lives are so very full. And I wonder in 2017 if that's not one of the ways, right? Greed, pride gets in the way and just really pushes God. Out. We wouldn't overtly say, curse God and die. We wouldn't be Job's wife, but maybe we're cursing God with the choices we're making and really how much time God gets of our day. Shouldn't He be a part of every moment of our life? And I don't know if that's terribly fitting because I, I do realize that in the heart of this context when you see what's going on things sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality and thus you also have verse 15 those who hold the, doc, the doctrine of the Nicolaitans which things I hate in the same manner these individuals and I was really hoping brother Williamson would have taken a lot longer uh, and explain if Ephesus was having a hard time with that and and I don't know all I want to know about this group of individuals but in some way they're related to uh, the work of Balaam uh, and Balak in terms of putting that stumbling block before them and some thinking you know wanting preeminence and you know using their uh, you know the Christian liberty their license and in, in introducing all sorts of filth and haven't we seen a sense in which our church and maybe our very lives aren't so concerned about purity, aren't so concerned about uh, morality, and it's really okay, don't judge me type of mentality. And we see the intermingling. No, we're not going to overtly say, I hate God or I don't want any part of God in my life. But maybe some of the decisions we're making and some of the choices that we're putting forth as disciples of Jesus don't really represent what his word is all about and there's a challenge there for us as we think about that repent or I'll come to you quickly and I'll fight against them with the sword of my mouth I think about this need to change and oh, how, like I said, we could, the list could go on and on. And, and I hope you'll think seriously about ways in your life that, that maybe are a little out of step. We did an exercise, and I'll recommend it to you for this section. Here, make some application of uh, 13 through 15. We talked about what our lives were filled with last week in our men's class. You make a list of the things that your life's filled with. What did you spend your last two weeks doing? And, and we listed all those things. And then we said, what did Jesus' life look like? What are the things Jesus spent his life doing? And we just kind of had a heart to heart and said, well, do, do those mesh? Do those add up? And I think that would be a good way for us to think about spiritual idolatry. For us to think about the ways in which we're letting Satan in the back door. No, we're not just running full force there, but... Man, he infiltrates so sneaky into our lives. And oh, how we need to put up those roadblocks that we may not let those put a stumbling block before the, ch the children of spiritual Israel. Repent or else I'll come to you quickly. And it's interesting to think about this word where you dwell. I know your works. We're, we're coming there. I know. I, I can sense a uh, sense and there's a staleness and I wish that I could bring to life the words better. But I, I know your works and where you dwell. It, it's this idea of permanency. I know where you dwell, where you've put your roots down and you've put your roots here and, and I, I'm, I'm stationed here and sometimes we get so comfortable because when he talks to churches in sort of a more positive way like he did in in the book of Peter in first Peter he talks about the diaspora right you pilgrims and all through the Old Testament and the New Testament there's this idea that hey you're you're not comfortable there you're just temporary 
residence. But I don't know for sure because it's in verse 13 where there's this commendation, but you dwell there. And maybe it's this reminder, and at least certainly it's a biblical principle for us to understand and to realize, don't get so comfortable there. Connected with that is the very name of this church, this town, Pergamos. Two words put together completely and married. And maybe there's a challenge set before us. Who are we completely married to? And it's almost like Pergamos, you have a, a, a really something to answer. Something to, to coming upon you. What is your decision going to be? Are you completely married to me? I had the opportunity to officiate my sister's wedding. And just any time you have the opportunity to think about the scriptures and marriage, it's unbelievable that any time, not any time, but a lot of times, when God wants to show how much He loves us, when He wants to express to us in human terms that, that He truly cares about us, that He loves us and He, he wants us, He uses marriage, Ephesians 5, or He even uses a marriage ceremony, a wedding Re, uh, Isaiah 61, Revelation 19. He uses the ceremony itself to remind you how beautiful it is. Are you completely married to me? Are you committed to me? And we know this letter is about, is about persecution coming. To have hope. Let the hope drive you. Because of that hope, I work. Because of that hope, I'm in a spiritual battle. How do they do it? <laughs> do you ever read through Paul's letters and wonder how in the world do you, you remain steadfast? How do you have that much faith in God's going to take care of you? He's going to walk with you and be there with you. And, and I thought that even to the point of death, you see, they... They stood at first, even to the point of death they were willing, but Satan was able to come in the back door. And the reason he was able to come in the back door is what's related to Philippians chapter 1. Remember when, when Paul says, for me to live is Christ. And he's telling that, those Philippian brethren, he's saying, listen, it's, I, I want to come to you. <laughs> it's better for you that I come to you, but I, it's, I would rather go see Jesus. And I sort of had an aha moment. I've been preaching through Philippians chapter 1 and then I, I saw that here in this marriage and I, I thought, that's how. That's how they would know they needed to repent. I wonder if you see it. What are your plans this week? In the next 30 days? In the next year? Do you have some big things out before you? I really struggle with this because, because you know, I, I've got three boys. And it's an absolute blast watching them grow. <laughs> it's an absolute blast watching you guys grow. I can't wait to see some of the things that y'all are going to accomplish and who you're going to be. And, and I can't wait. And I can't wait for my son's soccer game this next week to watch him play soccer. It's amazing. It's hilarious. Baseball season's coming up. And some days I'd rather do that. And often I think about that more than the day I'll see Jesus. And I absolutely think that's how he was able to sneak in the back door. What would you rather do right now than go see Jesus? And if you have some things on your mind and on your heart, I hope you'll be open and honest enough to know maybe He's talking to you here when He says you better repent. I don't think it's wrong for us to desire those things and I hope you don't get that from me at all. I, I hope that if we're here and my, to watch my sons get married and have kids and all those great things, but would I rather do that than see Jesus? And Satan was able to sneak in the back door and 
Can you imagine that you give up Christ in your marriage to Him because of sexual sin? It's so fleeting. It's so passing. It's so weak. For those of you who have faithfully been married for so long, it gets better and it gets better. And it gets better and what God says about marriage is unbelievable. And His plan there, we can come to learn and trust in Him. But oh, the things that we give up. Oh, how weak our faith is and our lives are because we're not ready to go see Jesus in these passing moments. If you need to repent, <laughs> look at the promise that's there. And here's the promise in every one. And again, I feel like the brother getting ribbed. All the commentaries that I read said, this is one of the most difficult promises and blessings to interpret uh, over and over. And it's difficult for me. And I don't completely know and understand and probably won't do the best to you. But I, I know because it's one of these blessings. And when you add them all up and you look all together, it's going to be wonderful. It's going to be absolutely amazing. It's going to be incredible. And I'll read it to you and maybe make a comment. And I challenge you, and I know we don't have to do it publicly, but if you're not ready to see Jesus, and actually, if you wouldn't rather, if you've got somewhere to go and you're like, Corey, stop preaching. And I know that might be for some of you, but if you would rather do something else right now than go see Jesus, you are in serious trouble spiritually. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat. And I will give him a white stone, an honest stone, a new name written, which no one knows except him who receives it. There's this sense in which he who has an ear. It's, it's interesting that all the churches start out and they're written to the church broadly. And then as it comes down to the end, he says, hey, you in that pew, or you right there in that pew, right? And he, he, he puts this finger right at me. You who have an ear, you listen up. Respond to this message. Listen to these things. A new name. A white stone, perhaps a reference to what a judge might, you know, you, the white stone is uh, you're, you're free and uh, guilty with the black stone. And perhaps that's what it has reference to or as friends would pass around the white stone or a white stone was a ticket uh, to different uh, events and different things that are referenced. And perhaps uh, the reason this one's so difficult is because there's not another scripture to help you interpret. Scripture is the best interpreter of scripture and there's not another one for us to talk about and think about in this way. But the new name, and I'll just put this one before you, and I don't know. I know it's at least a biblical concept. I don't know if, if it's what's coming here. But to think about how Abraham, right? Abram to Abraham, and uh, uh, Saul to Paul, Simon to Peter. And we think about what that new name might represent. To think about this change, and the name in which no one knew a moment ago we read in Revelation 19 that there's this name that Jesus had that no one knew and then they said the name. But there's this sense in which it was uh, of the nature uh, and who He was and who we become. It's, it's a different personal struggle that each of us has to battle. And I don't know if that's exactly what's going on here, but I know it's true in our lives today. You're here this afternoon and you maybe had a whooping of a week. <laughs> You're battling cancer. Or your family's battling cancer. Alzheimer's just racking our families. Or sickness is just grabbing me. Or financial burden is taking over my life. Or these, all these different things that were coming in. There's this new experiences that we're facing. And we know absolutely without a shadow of a doubt because of this book and the way that God's among His lampstands, right? He's among His churches. He knows me individually. Search me and try me, Psalm 139, 23 and 24. See if there's some way in me that's not right. And I know that's what he's calling to do, like it was in Pergamos, saying, hold to me, you can overcome. I want to give you that new name. I want to give you that white stone. Would you rather go see Jesus right now than anything else? If the answer is no, 
If there's something that's touched you and you realize your life's a miss, if there's something we might be able to help you with, if we can encourage you in some way, we'd love nothing more than to pray with you, to hug your neck, or encourage you in some way as together we stand and as we sing. Oh,